the last session, we introduced the concept of using option pricing models in the context of valuation. In this session, I hope to flesh out that concept by looking at one specific type of option, the option to delay. To see what this option is all about, think about an investment. Let's say that investment is not viable today. It's not a good investment if you took it today. But having the exclusive rights to the investment could still be valuable, right? Because that investment, even though it's not good today, could become a good investment in the future. That is the insight that we're going to use to use option pricing to value a patent, a non-viable patent, a patent working its way through the pipeline, to value undeveloped reserves, even though those reserves might not be reserves that you would extract right now at today's prices. That is a useful insight to get, and it might allow you to value businesses that otherwise would be impervious to traditional valuation models. So now that we've laid the foundations for real options being used in valuation, let me talk about one very specific option, which is the option to delay. What is the option to delay? To understand the option to delay, we've got to go back to basic corporate finance. When you're asked to analyze a project, here's how you're trained to do it. You estimate the expected cash flows in the project, you discount those cash flows back to the present, and you come up with a net present value. If that net present value is negative, you're told the project is a bad project, you should reject it. If the net present value is positive, that's a good project, you should take it. That's a very good rule to remember, but here's something to follow up on. Is it possible that you can have a project which has a negative net present value today, but the exclusive rights to that project could still be valuable? I think so. In fact, let me reframe that. Would you pay to get the exclusive rights to non-viable technology today? Sure, it's non-viable today, but it could become viable in the future, right? In fact, if you think in terms of option payoff diagrams, here's what I think about when I think about the option to delay. When the value of the expected cash flows from taking this project is less than the initial investment, this is an out-of-the-money option. So let's assume you have an investment with a negative net present value today. Having the exclusive rights to it, though, gives you the following choice. If the value of the expected cash flows rises in the future, and who knows what might cause it to rise? The market could change, the technology could change. If the value exceeds the initial investment, you could take the investment and make the difference. In other words, your negative net present value could become a positive net present value. In hindsight, could you regret buying the exclusive rights to this project? Absolutely. The project may never become viable, in which case, what have you lost? You lost what you originally paid to get the exclusive rights to this project. I'm going to use two real-world examples to bring this home, where it might help you in valuing businesses. The first is when you have to value a patent. A patent gives you exclusive rights to commercialize something, a technology, a process, something you've patented. It gives you the exclusive right. It's not an obligation. So if you have a patent, you do not have to develop it into a product. That's your choice. And what will drive that choice? Very simply, two numbers. One is the cost of converting that patent into a commercial product. Let's, for the moment, give it an abstraction. Call it I. The other is the value of the cash flows you will get by converting the patent into a commercial product. Let's call that V. If V is greater than I, the present value of the cash flows exceeds the cost of converting the patent into a commercial product, you will develop the patent. If not, you will sit on the patent and wait. For how long? As long as you have the exclusive rights to that patent. You have the makings of an option, right? In fact, if you were to take a patent and look at the cash flows, this is what the payoff diagram will look like on a patent. The strike price is going to be the cost of converting the patent into a commercial product. That will become the equivalent of the strike price. If the value of the underlying assets is your, is your stock price, the value of the underlying asset here is the present value of the cash flows you would get if you develop the patent today or tomorrow, a week from now, a month from now. So that's going to be a shifting number. If the value of the cash flows exceeds the cost of converting the patent into a product, you're going to develop the patent and keep the difference. If it doesn't happen, then you're going to throw the patent away. A lot of patents never get commercialized. Of course, the cost you paid to get the patent has to be written off. And what is that cost? You might have bought the patent from somebody else, but it's more likely that you develop the patent internally. That's your R&D cost. One way to think about R&D expenses is that the price you pay to get patents and options. And given that options are more valuable when there's more risk, it also tell you that, that tells you that your R&D is going to deliver more value if it's directed to areas where you know less, where there's more uncertainty, 
than if it's directed to areas where you know more, other things remaining equal. So let's try this out. To try this out on a real pattern, you need the inputs, the option pricing model, right? So let me take you through the process of how you might be able to estimate those inputs. Let's start with the first and most difficult input, the value of the cash flows you would get if you developed the patent. Here's what you need to do. Sit down and act as if you developed the patent right now. Estimate the expected cash flows you'd get from developing the patent today. That'll require projecting the cash flows out, and you're gonna complain and say, that's too much uncertainty. Say, that's good. Make your best estimates. Discount those cash flows back at a risk-adjusted rate. What you get as a present value is going to become the S in the model, the value of the underlying asset. The second input is the variance in that value. Unlike a traded stock where you can look up the past variance in the stock, when you're looking at a project or a patent, there is no past price variance that I can use. So here are a couple of suggestions. One is you can do what's called a Monte Carlo simulation. What that allow, requires you to do is to make assumptions about the variables, not just in terms of point numbers, just in, in, in expected value, but to give me a distribution. If you can do that, not only can I give you the expected value of the cash flows, but I can give you a standard deviation or a variance in that value. It's not difficult to do, but it's a lot of work. So here's a shortcut you can use. You can use industry average variances in firm value. There are publicly traded companies in this business. You can use those publicly traded companies' prices to back into variance. It's not perfect, but it's easy to get. That'll then become the variance used in the option pricing model. The strike price should be relatively simple. The question I'm asking you is, how much will it cost you to convert this patent into a commercial product? And presumably, you have a history of doing this, so you should give me a number. The remaining inputs fall out of the option. For the life of the option, I'm gonna look at the remaining life of the patent. So if you have 15 years left in the patent, that'll become the life of the option. The risk-free rate is the risk-free rate over that life. So let's try this out on a real example. This is a valuation I did of a drug called Avenix, a drug to treat MS that a company called Biogen came up with in the late 90s. Why am I going back so far in time? Well, to get the inputs to an option pricing model, you need access to some internal numbers, and most companies don't provide you that access. In this case, I got lucky. The company had projected cash flows from developing the drug immediately taken the present value of those cash flows and come up with a value of 3,422 million. That's what they estimated the value of the cash flows would be if they developed Avenix immediately. The cost that they estimated to convert the drug into a commercial product was 2.875 billion. This would be the first drug that this company developed internally. Their earlier drugs had been licensed out to other larger pharmaceutical companies. If I just stop there, 3,422 minus 2,875, I get a number 547 million. If I'd been doing traditional capital budgeting, that would have been the net present value of this project. But they haven't made the investment yet. It's still an option. If I put in the remaining life of the option, which is 17 years, and I put in the variance, in this case, I use the variance of publicly traded biotechnology companies into the equation, and then I add one final variable. With a, with a regular option, if it's in the money, you will tend not to exercise it because it always pays for you to hold an option and preserve the time premium rather than exercise early. Now with the real option, I would prefer you exercise early. If you have a 17 year patent, I don't want you to wait till the last day of the 17th year to exercise the patent. And the only way I can do that is to introduce what I call a cost of delay. In other words, I've got to introduce something here that leads you to exercise the option. And here's what I'm going to do. There are 17 years left on this patent, right? It's already a viable patent. You could develop it today. You can choose to wait, but if you choose to wait, here's what you're gonna lose. You're gonna lose one out of those 17 years of protection, and I'm gonna treat that as a cost of delay. It takes on the same role as a dividend yield in the option pricing model. I plug the numbers into a standard Black-Scholes model. The value that I get for the option is 907 million. Now, without going into the mechanics, think about it. The net present value is 547 million. The value of the option is 907 million. The difference of 360 million is the option premium. No wonder analysts love real options. You're adding premiums on to traditional discounted cash flow valuation. So that's the value of patent, and you could extend that process to value a company with two patents, three patents, 
I wouldn't do this if I were valuing a large, large pharmaceutical company with lots of established products, but I would use this approach to value a small biotechnology company or a pharmaceutical company with a single product or two products working their way through the pipeline. Let's take a second example of the option to delay. You're an oil company and you have undeveloped oil reserves. You can choose to develop those reserves. You can choose to leave them under the ground. That choice is going to be driven by what happens to, option, to, the, to prices for oil. And here's the basic decision process. Let's assume it will cost you X dollars to get the oil out of the ground. That's the cost of actually extracting the oil. You're going to compare that cost to what you think you can sell the oil for. And based on oil prices, let's say that value is V. If V is greater than X, you're going to develop the reserve and extract the oil. If V is less than X, you're going to sit on it and wait. Wait for what? For oil prices to go up? What happens if they don't? Well, you give up on the reserve, but you have an option. So let's see what the payoff diagram looks like for an undeveloped oil reserve. The cost of extracting the oil from the ground becomes the equivalent of the strike price. The value of the oil in the ground becomes the equivalent of the underlying asset, and that value will change on a day-to-day -day basis as oil prices change. If the value exceeds the cost, you will extract the oil and keep the difference. If the value is less than the cost, you're going to write off the cost of getting those reserves in the first place, which either might have been bought in an auction or might have come out of your exploration costs. So let's see if we can put some numbers or think of ways of estimating these inputs for an undeveloped oil reserve. For the value of the oil under the ground, the underlying asset, here's what I'd suggest you do. Based upon oil prices today and perhaps the forward curve, estimate what your cash flows would be if you develop those reserves today. Get the present value using a risk-adjusted discount rate. That present value will be the equivalent of the value of the underlying asset. For the strike price, use your experience. You know what it costs you to extract oil from the ground. It might be different depending on whether the oil is shale oil, whether it's under the ocean, whether it's under rocks. Use that as your exercise price. For the variance in the value of the underlying asset, you have a little easier, easier job here than in the patent because all you need to give me is the variance in the oil price. And since it's a traded asset, you can actually look at historical data. For the life of the option, if you get these reserves for the next 15, 20, 25 years, that'll become the life of your option. And here again, as with the patent example, I'm going to introduce a cost of delay. By choosing not to exercise the option once it becomes viable, you give up something, right? You give up the cash flows you'd have got by extracting oil from the ground. I'm going to put that in as the equivalent of a dividend yield or a cost of delay. What that's going to make you do is develop these reserves sooner or later if oil prices move in the right direction. So let's take a very simple example to bring these all together. Let's suppose you're an oil company with an undeveloped reserve. There are 50 million barrels of oil under the ground. Right now, let's assume that you think that those 50 million barrels can be sold and will make you $12 a barrel, so $600 million worth of oil under the ground. To keep things on an even, even keel, let's also assume it'll cost you $600 million to extract the oil. Sounds like an at-the-money option, right? But let's add one catch. If you decide to develop these reserves, it'll take you a couple of years to get the oil under the ground. So the $600 million of oil you see under the ground, you're not going to see them for a couple of years. That's essentially going to make it less valuable than $600 million. That's a number I'm going to use in my option pricing model because I've got to be realistic. When I exercise a natural resource option, the oil is not going to come out of the ground tomorrow. To add to the problem, I'm also going to give you a variance in oil prices, and in this case, that's 0.03. And I'm going to assume, at least for this example, that you have 20 years left on this reserve. You either have to extract the oil in those 20 years or give it up. I have all the inputs I need. I plug them into the model. Most of the inputs in this model are pretty straightforward. The exercise price is the $600 million that will cost me to extract the oil. I have 20 years left on this reserve, so that will become the life of the option. I use the riskless rate over a 20-year period. The only number that requires a little tweaking is that $600 million worth of oil under the ground. If you notice, I've taken out the first two years of cash flows, 5% a year, out of that $600 million, because I have to wait two years to see those cash flows. I also introduce that cost of delay of 5%. I put the numbers in, and I see some magic. The numbers as you see them suggest that this reserve is a non-viable reserve, right? It'll cost you $600 million to develop the reserve, and you're going to get well below $600 million, about $544 million. But valued as an option, 
This reserve is worth 97 million. Put differently, if you were at an auction bidding for this reserve, you'd be willing to bid up to 97 million. You say, why would I bid so much money for a non-viable reserve? Because oil prices are volatile. And that's a lesson to keep in mind when you think about options. Just because you have an investment that doesn't make sense today doesn't mean that the exclusive rights to that investment will not be worth money. So summing up, use real options selectively, but especially in cases like the ones we've described here, where you have patents, where you have undeveloped reserves, it's a useful way to think about the value of those reserves, and more important, what drives the value of those reserves.